your room. Yeah, what you're doing. Sure. So I just flip this. Hope you can all see that. So last year, and, um, about this time, uh, the city council had been working on both capital improvements plans for the sewer and water systems uh, and with the rate impacts to be for those. Rain over drop. just one second. Huh? We have, do we have more, we have more of these, I believe. Like the handouts? Yeah. Oh, they're right by the door. Yeah. On the table by the door where you came in. My, my apologies, right. So if anybody needs a handout that has a one there at the entrance to the door. So this followed uh, several months of analysis of what the city's uh, sewer and water systems were like, what capital improvements were needed, and still recovering from <coughs> the impacts of the Great Recession. Um, so we went Excuse through. Excuse me, I don't understand that. What do you mean the impacts of the Great Recession? Let me get to that. I, I have a slide that might help explain that. But but you you're speaking you're speaking in uh, you know some sort of generality here. You know, you be specific. You were hired to do this, right? To make this presentation? That's correct. So, all right. Well, then you be very specific. When, when people ask questions, about. could they state their names so we all know who are Absolutely. Thinking? My name is Diane Anderson, and I live at uh, 1409 uh, Falcon Loop, and I'm an owner there. So, if we could ask your patience to let the present presentation and the presenter continue so that we can, other people well, have an opportunity to. Excuse me. Can I, excuse but, me, but can you not interrupt speaking, constantly, ma'am? Ma'am, could you could you please not interrupt constantly? We're trying to get we're trying to allow other people to listen through this process. Yeah. So may we have the speaker identify himself? Who Absolutely. Is? Thank you. Sure. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Ray Bartlett. I'm retired uh, since uh, this past January. From uh, my company was called Economic and Financial Analysis. So I was a financial consultant to. A multitude of municipalities in the Pacific Northwest on issues similar to this and to other corporations as well. Um, so the city had retained me to assist them with some financial decision making and rate setting purposes. Uh, this started actually as far back as 2009, I believe. At that time, just to give you a little history, uh, the city hadn't completed audits in the previous three years. Its uh, finances were mess to say the least and it just obligated itself to help fund an internet service uh, for the cities of Independence and Monmouth. So at that point uh, the city was facing some capital improvements in both the sewer and water systems and at that point we were looking at how to finance those improvements. Those improvements by the way are yet to be constructed and when I said the city was impacted by the recession, I'm saying that they lost revenue just like most of the businesses in the city did as well. So let me pile through this if I may. Uh, my background is economics and finance. Um, my company was in business for uh, 26 years. Um, so I had a fairly long history with several municipalities. And I can cover that in a little more detail as we go along. <coughs> So this presentation was made to the City Council last year, and it's that presentation I'm remaking to you. At that time, the City Council went through, I forget how many meetings we, I attended um, to discuss the options the city had for adjusting rates and for dealing with future capital improvements and how to tie those two together so that the two utilities would remain solvent. The city at that time, of course, faced other issues with their other departments. So today we're just talking about sewer and water. There's also police, administration, parks, planning, and so on that uh, the city is also responsible for. So when I did that presentation, this last presentation to them uh, last year, and you know, when they made their decision, um, I was relying on the fact that I'd met with them several times before. So some of this presentation is a bit cryptic because I was able to condense things down to the several points that needed to be brought out. So I'll try to fill in uh, the background as I go along so that you'll understand a little better as well. So tonight, uh, we'll go through the review of the analysis, both for sewer and water, 
discuss the comparisons to other cities in Oregon, and then open discussion. Um, and uh, hope to be able to talk through the issues that you see. So let's talk about the sewer utility first. <coughs> How we got to where we are, um, up to 2015 um, is all history. So starting in 2009, uh, we recorded the number of equivalent dwelling units. That's what EDU stands for up there. Uh, at this point, it works. Um, the percent of EDU. So assuming that in 2009, there were 100% of the EDUs. That's how many people were built out. So an equivalent dwelling unit is the amount of water and the amount of sewage that the average single family household produces. And the way your rates are structured is that if you're a non-residential customer or a multifamily development, you pay according to how many equivalent dwelling units of water you use and you're charged on that basis. So restaurants, uh, corporations that are manufacturing things, retail stores, all pay according to how much water they use because it's assumed to go into the sewer system. <clears throat> so when we look at that and make the calculations uh, between 2009 and 2012, the city was losing revenue on its sewer utility because the number of customers buying service from you was decreasing. Not necessarily just the household sector, but it was more likely in the commercial sector where restaurants are doing less business, laundries are doing less business, hairdressers were doing less business because of the recession. Consequently, the city was facing declining sales. Up to 2009, I might point out, the city was growing and pretty rapidly and the city was making a lot of decisions based on the fact that, that growth would continue. Between 2009 and 2015, the city dropped into uh, the recession. And by 2015, as you can see, it had grown 1% over what it was in 2009. And this is kind of more of a financial tool that we use to evaluate utilities, uh, no matter where they are because it gives you a good idea of what all the customers are doing, not just one sec segment. Um, so knowing that that was going on, the city also cut its operating costs in the sewer utility. And here we're just looking at personnel and materials and services. These are the recurring costs that have to be paid each year uh, in order to operate the utility, strictly operations. So you may recall the city cut its staff pretty substantially after 2009 and also reduced the amount of routine maintenance it was doing on its systems, sewer and water. And that's what brought down their operating costs a bit. Debt service didn't change, however, uh, because that's paid regardless of what happens. I'll get to that in a second. What the city did was to increase its rates and since 2009, the rates have increased about 163% for sewer. And uh, the city had to do that in part because many of the costs in operating the system are unavoidable. Right? They, get, uh, they, they incur costs regardless of how many people are actually using the system. The city did all it could and cut back as much as it could, but it's also deferred a lot of maintenance going forward. So if we look at the forecast that the council looked at, let just back up a bit and show you this. That bar at the bottom, somewhere here I've got a pointer, there it is. This bar down here represents debt service, and it's pretty small. In 2013 and 14, the city- Debt service would be the interest and pay, payment for interest and principal on on bonds, yes. I'm sorry, I, I, I should have clarified that. That's the principal and interest that's owing on the bonds the city had issued in the past to make capital improvements to its system. So with the declining economy, interest rates were also dropping. So in 2013, the city refinanced the sewer debt, and they refinanced the sewer debt at a much lower interest rate than it was before, and that caused the, the peaks to drop a bit Starting in 2016, this fiscal year, um, well, let's, let me go through this little graph first. This line is net operating income. So net operating income is important um, because 
represents what's left over after you collect all the revenue from you, the ratepayers, and you pay all the operating costs, but before you pay debt service. And typically, you want that margin uh, between the line and peaks on debt service to be pretty substantial because the people who lent you the money want to make sure that you're first paying to maintain and operate the utility correctly so that if you fail in your debts, they're not taking over a defunct system. So first and foremost, you pay operating costs. And then just to make sure that things work right, the bonds call for charging an amount above operating maintenance costs to cover debt service, plus up to 125% of debt service, or 25% more than debt service. And that simply provides security, especially against fluctuating economic conditions that can impact the utility. So starting in 2011, when we started the pretty major rate increases going forward, we got the utility out of the red. You'll notice in 2010, that the utility was actually in default of its bond because it wasn't collecting enough revenue. Net operating revenues was less than debt service. So we got that up to the point where it was covering more than that. 2015 was kind of a blip because of back payments of systems development charges that were owing to the city from new developments that had started but didn't finish and now they paid up. So going forward uh, from 2016 to 2021, uh, we set the rates so that it will cover outstanding debts. And we've got two new debts involved. So this white line is cash balances. And you'll notice it goes up and down rather quickly. See the payment of past SDC revenues. In 2017, we think the city will issue a bond to make capital improvements to the sewer system. The sewer system, as it stands now, is a lagoon-type system. It was last expanded in, I believe it was 1976, about 40 years ago. So it hasn't been expanded since then, but the city has grown since 1976. So it's at its capacity, and it's failing to meet its discharge permits. The discharge permit is a license that the state of Oregon, actually it's the U.S. Department of Environmental Protection Agency that passes that responsibility on to the state of Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, that you discharge the wastewater after it's been treated from the sewage treatment plant into a receiving stream. Uh, the city, because of where it's located and the receiving streams it can take it, has a zero discharge permit during the summer. In other words, the streams that it discharges to aren't big enough to handle the flows that would come from the sewage treatment plant. So the city has to store all the treated wastewater uh, between June 1st and November 1st each year. Well, in the recent past, it's been unable to do that. It's had to make discharges because the lagoons overfill. So it's in violation of its permit. So in 2016 and 17, the city plans to make capital improvements. Um, and the primary part of that capital improvement is to spray irrigate the the the, the uh, discharge in the summer so it goes on to fields that are growing crops and therefore will uptake the water and instead of buying the land they're simply leasing the land because this can't be a long-term solution the way it's originally constructed and then somewhere around 2019 or 2020 the city will then expand the wastewater treatment plant the engineers are currently evaluating the most cost-effective way that, that would be to make that happen. So they're looking for the least cost options at this point. Uh, the lagoon system that you have is one of the least expensive methods of treating wastewater. All of the other methods involve mechanical plants, which take electricity, worn out parts, <laughs> and I can tell you are vastly more expensive than that. Um. 
<coughs> okay, so just to be clear, the lagoon system that we have, and I'm, I work in school, I don't know, you know, all these, a lot of these things that you're discussing, but um, the lagoon system is what we have. And from June to November, we're storing the water because we can't release it into whatever streams we normally would release it into. So we're going to irrigate farms and things of that nature. That's correct. So why on earth, especially given how when I say green, I don't mean the color green, but like, you know, environmentally friendly Oregon is, why aren't we doing that all the time? And then wouldn't that relieve some of the cost because we're just treating all these grounds here, all these trees that you have growing, the parks, all the parks around the town, the city, with reclaimed water. I don't understand why there's such a, you know, I don't understand why we wouldn't do that anyway, which would then, I would think, lower costs because we're not running fountains with fresh water and flower you know watering our trees with fresh water and I just don't I don't understand that part of it. I'll give you the short answer but because I'm not an engineer I just talk to engineers and have to finance what they come up with and argue with them about what really needs to be built. There's degrees of treated water. Okay. So the water that comes out of your wastewater treatment plant can't be used on food crops. Correct. And it cannot be used on landscaping that humans would come in contact with. So it's essentially being put on grasslands where the grass finishes the treatment process. And it can't run through your freshwater system. That's a little Would you stand up and give your name? Sure. You My name is Ken Day, DA what? I live in Independence. Mm -hmm. So there are some treatment options out there that do. And I've got some clients that are actually looking at treatment options that are so pure that the water is drinkable when it comes out. That kind of water will go into lines, but it's extremely expensive to get water treated to that level. So if you can imagine that it costs this much to get the 80% of the contaminants out and costs this much to get the next 10% out, uh, you can see why you look for the least cost options that meet federal requirements. Let me add, there are very large parts of the year because we are as wet as we are as a state that there is no, there is, the soils are saturated, the trees have all the water they need, and any water you put out there would not be taken, any discharge water you would put out there would not be taken in by the plants at any, at any rate. So it would have to be just, would discharge off into the streams or the other receiving sources. Which is what it's being done with anyway, right? It's just charging those streams somewhere? Well, it usually a stream um, is that, it's a, a hydrologic, uh, unit that passes water to the ocean. Can I just add sure. that? We, we, the City of Independence has a joint outfall with the City of Monmouth, and we discharge to the Willamette River. I just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. So then, and I'm not, not arguing, not fighting, I just want to be clear so that I have understanding. Water that would not be clean enough to put on food crops, but that we put in other types of fields were discharging into the river? Yes. Under permit. Under permit and at a time of year when the river is capable of absorbing that water. water. It has to have a certain flow in the river to for any of the cities along the river to discharge unless you have a mechanical plant and a permit that allows you a year-round discharge, which they aren't giving anymore. Virtually every city in the valley does the same thing. So when DEQ makes these regulations, they're looking at the entire Willamette River and all the cities that drain into it uh, when they set the regulations on how much any one city can drop into it. So uh, that's what's going on in the history. That's what it looks like is going to happen. You'll notice that in 2019, 20, and 21, out of here, then we violate the rule about covering all of your costs, including debt service plus a margin above it. The city has applied to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which has a program to assist rural communities, which they define you as one, to offer you low-cost loans and, in fact, potentially grant. And the city has applied for both the grant and the loan to make these capital improvements. What you see in the chart there is assuming that all this is financed through the municipal bond market. That's the bond market you read about in the, in the 
Wall Street Journal that you hear about on the five o'clock news. Uh, USDA offers loan amounts that are anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the interest rate that the municipal bond market offers and for a much longer term. And they may offer you grant because of the level of your sewer rates. So if that happens, those peaks on the bonds will be lower and the requirement for rate increases may be lower. So starting in 2015, we said, let's make the bet that we get a grant and loan and looking at the worst case scenario, the USDA doesn't award you any low cost loans or any grants, but you have to go to the municipal bond market. Then when we get to 2018, the city council might have to adjust rates higher. If in fact grants come through, the rate increases could be lower. So you should begin to understand from the beginning that a forecast that runs out five or six years in these utilities shouldn't be viewed as something cast in stone. The city council has to review these and has been reviewing these decisions every year uh, to see how things go. So by the end of uh, this fiscal year, perhaps by the end of this calendar year, we'll know what USDA is going to do about this first loan, which is going to be somewhere around $4 million. So one of the things to keep in mind is the magnitude of these loans. So it's $4 million the first time, almost $8 million the second time. Just keep that in mind when we're talking about the water side. Treating wastewater is an extremely expensive proposition. I've got my way around that. You allow this person to ask a question. Uh, your, your, your first your first comment. I don't need that. Well, your first comment. Your people. first comment was that the reason that these rates went up was because you were trying to uh, you you you're, you're subsidizing mine. Uh, that was your first comment. You said that that was the, that was the reason. Well, that, let me get to water. That's where mine. No, you, <laughs> you know the question. The the thing is. These are the highest rates. $90 is a base rate for water and sewer in, the, in this community. And we are a small community, and for that to be so high, you know, and you're talking about the bond going up, and you know, $4 million, four bill, you know, that's, that's crazy. What we want to know is why are our rates so high? Well, let me answer and, that. And, 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 and the, the you rates said are. Minet. You said mine. We'll, we'll get to mine in just a minute. So the rates that the city charges are based on the costs it incurs to own and operate the system. So there's not a profit margin built into this thing, all right? So as I'm explaining, these are the reasons why the rates are what they are. So just to see what's going on on the capital side, uh, you'll notice that in the history up to this dashed line, the city cut back all of its capital improvements pretty close to zero in 2012, 13, and 14. That's deferred maintenance, deferred capital improvements. It was during that period that the city was also running in violation of its permit to discharge and was getting into deeper and deeper trouble with the regulatory agencies, uh, which have vast authorities to take over a system, set the rates to recover the cost to make the system perform right, so the city had to do something. So you'll notice the capital improvements costs go up pretty substantially and then drop off again by 2021. And at that point, uh, you should have a sufficient additional capacity to handle a, a modest amount of growth after 2021 in the treatment plant. There are other components to the sewer system. You do have pump stations. There are miles of sewer line buried underground that periodically need to be repaired, uh, cleaned, and sometimes replaced. So some of those capital improvements go into the, into the collection system for the sewer system as well. It's not just the wastewater treatment plant. So you gotta appreciate that sewer lines also wear out, and they wear out faster than water lines because of the product they're carrying. So your sewer lines are pretty old. Most of them are put in by development as it occurred. And those sewer lines are composed of different materials and of different sizes. So as the city grows, you often have to upsize some sewer lines in order to handle the additional sewage flows that go through them. 
but uh, all of those issues are being addressed by um, the city's capital improvements uh, planners, engineers, uh, looking at the systems and taking measurements. So that was pretty much a nutshell on sewer. So during the history, let me just finish this, then I'll take your question. Has to do with sewer. Pardon? It has to do with sewer. Okay. You said that uh, about four or five years that you had deferred maintenance and capital expenses on it. Wasn't that just digging us a hole uh, for the future when you guys didn't do anything to address those concerns in those years? That's true. The option was to raise rates higher and to borrow money sooner to make those capital improvements. So the city council did what, he, what they thought was financially prudent at the time, but yes, that does give you a whole, it's like not maintaining your street system. When you wear them down far enough, it's a major repair instead of just a resurfacing. So that's why we have the big uh, increase that contributed to it, but the other thing that contributed to it is just that you've got a very old system. The treatment system was last expanded in 1976. So it's been out there for 40 years and it's finally reached its maximum capacity and needs to be expanded and is failing to meet its discharge permits. Well, my concern is that you guys let defer all this stuff down in the future. You don't have to worry about it now, but your, your people that are going to replace you and the citizens here are going to have to pay the piper a lot more years down the road when you don't do any maintenance at all. That's correct. Um, but Why don't we get somebody here that can run the place right? Well, they, they have been, I think. I think that's well, I, unfair. Well, obvious from the graph that you show, it isn't happening. No, but the city was faced with some pretty difficult financial choices at the time and the city council made the choices they made to address the system. So the system has worked, okay? I don't think it's worked, because look what you're asking for in rate increases. We could have made those rate increases more rapid. And we could vote you out of office, too, for not doing a good job. Well, you can't do the job without the money. Then why, why go hide your head under the rock for four or five years? <laughs> and then all of a sudden it pops up and says, oh, we need to get this done. Yeah. Our place is going to hell in the handbasket. I, I wish there was an easy answer to that. But uh, yes, it'd be great if you could do all the maintenance every year, every time. But again, it takes money, and the money comes from the repairs. Let me, let me just finish I, this I, off. I, I do have a question, too, because you keep coming back to money um, and check. Uh, I think, Ms. Bush, last time you told us that $15 of the sewer uh, fees go to pay the debt on the Civic Center. So I, you know, the last water rate meeting you said a, a certain chunk of the sewer rates go to pay the debt on the Civic Center, the bonds on the Civic Center. And since we're talking about money, I'm just wondering if you were able to get a precise figure on that because I think last time you said you, you could break it out somehow. I don't recall saying that the sewer rates pay for the Civic Center. I don't recall that conversation, I'm sorry. You, okay. Question this, was at the, this was at the last water rate meeting and you said a portion of the fees go to pay debt service on the Civic Center. So I, I, I mean, this was my understanding. Do they do a, a, do a percentage not go to pay debt on this on the bonds to the Civic Center? No, not directly, no. Um, we do, in our budget, we do an overhead allocation from all of our utility funds to, to um, pay for administrative costs, but not to service debt in that this governmental debt, no. Is there any amount uh, from the sewer water rates that that go to to help defray the costs incurred by the building of the Civic Center, the City Hall here? We have no direct allocation that does that, no. Can you break down the allocation that you said at the last meeting includes uh, money that goes to pay that debt on the Civic Center? 
we do not have any direct allocation that goes to pay the debt for the Civic Center. Well, Ms. Bush, with all due respect, I, I believe a room full of people understood you to say that the last time that we met, that some of the fees went to service the debt on the, the Civic Center. Where, where, how are you paying the debt on the Civic Center if not from revenue so generated? The, the debt from the Civic Center is partially paid from the general fund and it sits with the urban renewal. And, and where are those funds, uh, where, do, where do those funds originate from? The urban renewal debt is, uh, well, okay, so this, the Civic Center debt is with the urban renewal. So the larger portion of the, ur of the urban, er urban renewal debt, which is the Civic Center at this time, is paid from uh, tax increment, increment taxes that uh, proper taxes. The general fund covers another portion of that debt and it is in the form of a uh, loan to the urban renewal um, because the urban renewal does not make enough increment taxes to pay that debt. So the general fund is uh, supported with uh, property taxes, uh, various state revenues, and uh, franchise fees, and then also there's an administrative allocation that we do from the utility funds to the general fund. So directly paying for ICC debt, the, there's no really true allocation that I would be able to make that would say that this portion of your water bill is going to pay for the Civic Center debt. Okay, well I think it was sewer that fees that were identified and also it was identified as an administrative allocation that was funneled in and then funneled out again. So I'd really like to follow up with you on this at, okay. at some point. Sure. So, just to finish this, if I may, um, during that period there was a lot of deferred maintenance that went on, and capital replacement also requires capital expansion for the system because the wastewater treatment plant is out of compliance. Uh, so the city's anticipating in the near term two new bond issues. The first issue that it says completed on there, but they've completed the application, but they still haven't gotten the final word on how the financing are gonna go. And the second issue will happen two or three years out from now. And again, it'll depend on what the market looks like at the time uh, for borrowing money and whether or not USDA is able to finance the project. But that's meant in sewer household bills, if I might point out, um, between 2010 and 2015, the base rates went from a, about $25 a month up to 43 dollars a month for the sewer base rate for single family residences. That's the equivalent dwelling unit rate, if you will. So during that period, you're right, rates went up an average of about 11% per year uh, to cover the costs. Going forward, we're looking at rates going from about $43 a month to about $56 a month, and an average of increase of about 4.4% per year. And again, don't take that as cast in stone. The city will have to evaluate this each year in light of what the costs are, how the financing has gone, and what the capital improvements costs come in at. Um, so at this point, we're looking at planning numbers. But that looks like a reasonable forecast uh, that may come to pass, plus or minus. Water utility, let's talk about that one and talk about my net. So their operating results look something like this. Uh, that bar down there is the debt service on water. So through 2013, it was around $300,000 a year in debt service that was being paid for with water rates. In 2014, you may recall the citizens passed a general obligation bond to refinance a whole bunch of the city's debts. I think there were five debts outstanding 
not all of them were water or sewer uh, debts, uh, but these are debts that the city had incurred in prior years. And we included the uh, city's water debt in that refinancing. So that shifted the burden of paying the debt service from water rates to property taxes uh, at a much lower interest rate than we had before. So there was a net benefit to the community, although the responsibility for repaying the debt shifted from you, the ratepayers, to you, the taxpayers. And, um, we can discuss that some and, more. And isn't, isn't independence a huge um, renter's market rather than an owner's market? So the property owners pay a lot more taxes than all of the people. There's a this is a huge rental market, huge rental market. So you transfer all the debt to the property owners, but not to the residents. Well, the residents are also property owners. No, they're not. Well, <laughs> no, they're not. How many of you own your own homes? He didn't say renters, he said residents. Yes. So in 2015, the debt service dropped to zero. Uh, going forward, uh, the city anticipates another bond issue in 2016 or 2017 to make improvements to the water system. Um, this is the debt that is burdened the water utility. This is the MyNet debt. So prior to 2012, MyNet didn't pay any debt service. You're all aware of what MyNet is. It's an internet service provider that the cities of Independence and Monmouth jointly built. And uh, when they borrowed the money to construct the MyNet system, each city had to pledge a backup security on the MyNet debts. So the primary security is that the net revenue from MyNet would pay the debt service. It hasn't been able to do that. First debt service payment came due in 2012. What the City of Independence had done is pledged revenues from its water utility to back up the debt service payments by MyNet. Um, since then, the amount that MyNet has been able to pay has increased a bit, and we're anticipating that it will increase so that going forward, the City's water utility will pay about $562,000 of that annual debt service. Um, this is a guess because we're not sure how successful MyNet will be in expanding its system and controlling its costs uh, in order to pay its debt service. The City of Monmouth, just to uh, round out this discussion, pledged the net revenues from its electric utility. So it's paying roughly the same amount, actually it's paying a bit more because they own more of the debt than the City of Independence does is using revenue from its electric utility to back up the MyNet debts. So you'll notice the MyNet debt is several times greater than the debt service on the water utility itself. So in order to respond to that, um, the city has had to increase its water rates. And it's done that, as you well know, and has set so that the net operating income now exceeds the total of the two debt services that it's obligated to pay. Um, uh, the City of Independence has been looking at the ability to refinance some of the my net debt going forward, but it doesn't have total control over that. Interest rates, as you know, have dropped considerably since the my net debt was taken out. But the bonds that were issued have clauses in them that delay when those bonds can be refinanced. So that'll be a ways out there. The city's anticipating one bond issue for water in 2016, and that bond issue is going to be for a little over a million dollars. He said, keep in mind the magnitude of the differences here. The sewer bonds were four and eight million, and the water bonds are one point something, 1.1 million roughly. Uh, to cover the cost of water. Water systems are inherently less expensive to build, maintain, and operate, 
In most cities, not all cities, I can tell you. I've got clients that have screaming high water rates, um, not necessarily because of uh, my net debt that they have. But pretty clearly, my net is a major reason for the water rates being what they are today. So, question? Yes. Over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, young lady. When this MyNet utility was first created, it was approved by the city council of both towns. The people didn't have a vote in it. That's correct. Okay. Uh, who bought the pig and the poke then? You mean who bought the bonds? No. Who bought the pig and the poke? The left Clear, who proposed this wonderful plan? Uh, well, that predates me. I wasn't involved with the city or that decision. Sir. I was here at that time. It was actually the city man, a former city manager for the city of Monmouth. He, he went on years later to go to Colorado, I believe. I can't remember his name. He was two city managers ago over there. When, when he left, the ball was handled, uh, handed to Greg Ellis, who was city manager here, but the project had already begun. And so he proposed this and, you, and the two cities bought off on it? The both city councils agreed, to, thought it was a good <coughs> idea. They were trying to fill a service uh, black hole, essentially. There were, there were no providers stepping up to give either city um, any kind of uh, fast internet service. That's, we, that's my understanding of the answer. Why did we then get involved in, in financing this when it wasn't feasible by other providers to come in and do a uh, or do an infrastructure? For that very for that very reason, uh, the fact that it wasn't feasible for the private sector to step in and make that investment. The two cities chose at that time to do so, so as to provide to provide that service to its residents. In hindsight, you know, it looks like it could have been, you know, the, the deal is questionable, but at, at the time it made it seemed to make quite a bit of sense to the decision makers. Do these decision, decision makers have any background in finance? And I don't know who the decision makers were. I don't know who was on council those years at those time at that time. I can't. It's hard to go back and question the decision that was made. 12 years ago by a different group of people in a different economy, different circumstances. So Today it is a burden. We are, we are, we wish it was not the burden that it was. We are trying very hard to influence the MyNet operation to find ways to close that gap between their revenues and their expenditures, but it, it is a great source of frustration for the city, both cities. So what is being done to control MyNet's costs? Um, probably a better question directed right, right to MyNet and the MyNet board and the MyNet operation. Um, I know the they... Board? Yes, it has, it has a separate operating board, separate right. governing board. You're on that board yourself? I am a... I am not a voting member of that board, no. I am a non-voting member. I haven't been to a meeting in some time now. But I can, I can tell you that, uh, you know, they're looking for as much in many as ways as possible to expand their market in as many ways as possible to increase their penetration into the community to get better a better percentage of those available sales uh, i don't know all the particulars because again i haven't been attending their meetings they recently reconducted an operating analysis of the uh, of the system to see if there are other ways to close that gap i think there's a, several ideas that they're going to take up here in the next month or two and I'm hopeful that those ideas are productive and will generate uh, a little more money for them, but I don't know the answer to that. So there are ideas that they have It's going to take money to implement. Where are they going to get the money to implement these new ideas and update their hardware? Yeah, you'll have to talk directly to my them to, to well, get that I, answer. I, I, don't, I don't know the answer to the question. But you're on your board, so you should be informed. I don't attend their meetings. I'm not a voting member of that board. Well, you don't have to be a voting member. I'm not at their meetings. You should be. You should be. You're a city manager, right? There's, and, there's and a city manager. There's a city manager. There's a city manager. There's a city manager. There's a 
because if they need to close down, let them close down. Everybody in my community. I, I'm trying to be as effective as I can from the position I'm in in the best way possible. And sometimes it's not easy to, to be effective with a different operation. Uh, they have their own governing board and their own governance, their own general manager. So I, I think they meet on a monthly basis. They meet every, the fourth Thursday is their scheduled meetings. I believe it's at uh, 7.30 in the morning every fourth Thursday. I, I think you, if you want to ask them what they're doing, that certainly is a, a great forum. They have to take public input you know, at their board meetings, just as our city council does. Go round and round, because you are the city manager, and you should have input if this is affecting our water laws because of the debt service that they have, and you should be involved in the fact that you're not, it's like for you to say, no, go to the other board. It's like, this is a typical government. No, it's not my responsibility. No, it's them. We're waiting for an answer. To which question, I'm sorry? To hers. Well, Why again, again, I think I have, I'm doing what I can in my position to be as effective as possible. We are very concerned. I don't know how many times we have a city councilor here. I don't know how many times I've told, you know, I've gone to our council and expressed the frustrations and they are very frustrated. They listen to the same reports that I listen to. We don't, you know, we, we are one half of the ownership. I am one out of seven members of that board. I have gone to meetings uh, in an effort to, I have raised issues. I've, I've recently participated in, in you know, in the operating analysis, my, you know, I get, I get one seventh of a, of a contribution and I provide that. Uh, we find ourselves at loggerheads frequently. I don't agree with much of what goes on. Uh, and that's how democracy works. When you have one out of seven votes or one out of seven voices, your value, the value of your voice is just that, one out of seven. So yes, I don't agree with the directions they've headed. Uh, we've, we've tried to make a difference. Um, I think there are things perhaps the other avenues would be explored, but again, it takes a majority of the board to to have control of those choices. Yeah, I don't Who owns my net? Who owns my net? The two cities own my net. Then you've got 50% of the vote. You talk to mama, and you've got 50%. No, I have one vote. I don't even have a vote. I have one voice out of seven. Yes, sir. I have a comment. Uh, I listen to politicians, lawyers, such as that, and I, all I hear is a lot of weasel words. No plan of action. Just you ask a politician to give you a, a straight answer on something, and they beat around the bush, and you never get a straight answer. What I heard from you was that you don't attend the meeting for several months, yet you say you're involved in it. To me, that's was weasel words that you're using. You're not telling us that you publicly oppose finance operation payments, so on and so forth. I want to hear something concrete, a plan, an action plan. Not that I don't go because it doesn't do me any good. Well, they will be forming. They are meeting in retreat shortly to consider the results of the operations analysis. They will be developing over the course of the next several months an updated strategic plan and business plan. So hopefully that plan will address the questions that you're raising right here, because that's the concrete outcome I believe that you're looking for. But don't so, you have a vested interest in it to see that it gets steered to uh, a resolution? Then you're not attending the meetings. Can I, can How can I you say that? Okay. The City of Independence has representation on the Minet Board of Directors. Okay. You tell me how many, we got uh, one, two, what, each city has three representatives? That's correct. Okay. Each city has three. You want to know why the city manager isn't there? He has a, what's the word of book? A person who's sitting there for, for him. Well, he didn't say that, but that's Well, I just did. Well, I'm just... Okay. Okay. The question, here's, uh, let, uh -huh. let me finish a minute. So there's this thing called MyNet. It happens to be one of the best fiber optics data systems in the United States. Now we're beating ourselves up, but that's a true statement. Okay, you can take it to the bank. We've had, cons we've had consultants say the same thing. Now, 
you want to go back and beat up somebody that got us into debt, I've only been here for three years, so I, I'm probably the same as a lot of you. We can't do it. It isn't going to do you any good to go beat somebody up that's already done the debt. So what you have to do is figure out a way to get ourselves out of this situation. Okay. okay? Now, I can't go into, I can tell you that what, what David just said about a strategic plan, they've never had a strategic plan. There's strategic plans being developed. And that strategic plan will provide the guidance to the general manager, Don Patton, who in my opinion is one of the best general managers I've ever been around. Uh, his employees, excellent. Do, is a good company. Not worth the money that is invested in it, but it's a good company if they were investing $6 million in it. Now, so what's gonna happen? I don't know, but the numbers up here, the $562,000, that is based on this year's, uh, this fiscal year's financial runouts, okay? So they've proven they can do that. It's been a financially stable company for the last two years. Financially stable, what's that mean? It means there hasn't been any surprises. Their, their budget, not heat budget, they'll go that. What they said they would make, they made. And they're paying the principal it's the interest right now, I believe, that they aren't paying, and they have plans in place, and then it'll come, they're, they're working on it right now, but in the strategic plan, there'll be more definition of how to go about making this thing into a zero some days. In other words, the city won't have to do anything anymore. And that's what we all want. But we also want the best freaking internet service you can get, and it's great. I mean, if you don't have it, okay, that's your choice, but, I have it, and I, can, I know in my opinion it's a really good internet system. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. You've got you've had the most intelligent answer tonight. Thank you very much. I appreciate. Well, that's because I'm on the board of finance for mine. Okay. Well, fine. But I volunteer. You can volunteer. Okay. Well, I, may I mean, there's it's, it, and all the meetings are public, so it's anyway uh, that that's where we are. Okay. I, I have a lot of confidence in my net, but you know what? I I refuse to do, and I, where I live. We get together almost every morning and have a little cup of coffee, and I get so tired of people beating up my net for something that happened 10, 15 years ago. It, you can't change it. We can talk about it, but you just can't change well, it's it. it's money out of our pocket. It is. But you can't change it. it you can't do anything about it. That's all I'm saying. So what we need to do is make it so that we don't have the money coming out of our pocket. More money down the rabbit hole? No, sir. I don't think you'll be How are they going to get the money to... Uh, do all these wonderful business plans, strategic plan that uh, they are going to upgrade stuff, right? No, a strategic plan just basically tell it's tell it, it helps the employees, it helps the the committees, uh, the cities know what, and the cities are really the overriding people who tell Minet what they should and shouldn't do. But Minet makes suggestions. It's something to document. And then give Minet, the employees of Minet, marching orders saying, this is where we want you to go. It's kind of like the Parks Department plan. They, they put together something, and then they don't have to discuss every little thing that happens. They do it. Will there be more money involved in Minet? Minet, any, any technology company is going to have to invest in technology. The question would be, who's going to pay for it? Well, who cares if we got the best in the United States? I do. I don't know if you guys do. I do. Not at the price we're paying for it. Oh yeah, our our prices are very competitive. My next price the is water bill is competitive. Not the water yeah, but we're subsidizing. Are we subsidizing it through our water rates? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Minus the interest that mine isn't being paid isn't paying. Yes, I call it subsidizing. I think that is being paid by Independence of Monmouth, right? You said that they were doing a good business had last two years, then why does the city of Independence Monmouth happen to pay five hundred and something? I said they were thousand? stable. I didn't say they were they were doing they are doing good business. You said they're a great business. It's a very good business. It's a debt ridden business that, that they had nothing to say about. Okay, the people that are working there now had nothing to do with the debt and they inherited it and they're trying to get it down. And they've done it. They're they're reducing it. They're reducing the amount that the cities of Monmouth and Independence have to pay. How much did the city of Independence Monmouth pay last year on that interest? Well, it's up there. 
in uh, last year it was 562,000. And what is it forecast for this year? We just held it at that same level. Keep in mind that the first year it was 687,000. Yeah. So since the new plan went into place starting two years ago, MyNet has started paying some of its debt service. Before that, it was paying zero of its debt service. I don't call that a successful business. Well, In the business world, they would go bankrupt. Yeah, well, you have to look at MyNet as being something other than a utility. It's in a competitive market. It's a they, deep hole that money's going down. One other factor I'd like to just leave you with is that you really can't shut down MyNet and have the debt go away. The only way you can do that is if you can sell the whole thing. So if you shut down MyNet tomorrow, the city would still be on the hook for 100% of the debt service, not just the interest, but the principal as well that uh, MyNet is responsible for. So to the point that it's not the best situation, for sure, financially, but if you shut it down, it'll cost your water rate payers more than it costs them now. So that they're paying anything on their debt service is a plus. What you'd like to do is to get them to pay all of their debt service. Were well, they gonna hold a lemonade sale to raise revenue? I think they've been looking at a lot of options. I'm not sure lemonade sales is one of them. I was suggesting a bake sale, but um, it didn't go far either. <laughs> It's not a simple situation to work your way out of, but yes, you have a system that is overcapitalized, and the question is how to, how best to manage it and minimize the cost to water rate payers and in independents and electric rate payers in Monmouth. This plan that they're going to have, and I understand what John was saying, that uh, employees might not able to get their marching orders based on the, the plan. I think how it will work is that there will be uh, private citizens involved with MyNet and they'll develop a strategic plan with MyNet's input, with the board of directors input, and then they will take the strategic plan to the board of directors for approval. And that's going to take more money to implement the plan? Well, I don't know what the plan is, but I, I wouldn't expect it would take any money that wouldn't be offset by increases in revenue slash uh, net profit. You know, I have a, I'm Victoria from the airport. Um, beyond the minor issue, I'm, I'm upset that we, the city has acquired this waterfront property and now are dumping tons of money into that when we have these issues. It's kind of like, when do we stop doing things like that and fix what we've already got before we add more costly, factors to our our budget and our finances I mean that doesn't make any sense to me so more than the minette issue which is already like Ken has explained it's there we've got to deal with it and we're still struggling to find ways to deal with it and we're still talking about water and sewer increases because we're trying to cover all these extra things and now we've got this waterfront issue that the city's dumping millions into just to get it ready to hope for someone to come in and, and buy it and develop it. I'm having a really hard time with that one because of all this. That's a big, big conversation. I can sort of talk to you a little bit about the uh, urban renewal approach, the property, Independence Landing, the former Valley concrete site. The ultimate goal there, and we will support that with good economic analysis, is that, that it return money to the city, not cost the money city. So yes, there will be, as in any urban renewal district, there is upfront investment, upfront up uh, collaboration to bring in the kind of development you're looking for. But the end goal is always to produce more than it costs. We think, as we proceed in this and the analysis we've done so far and the partners we've, we're working with, we think that will be realized. And what that, would, what that will mean to you as the ratepayers and the taxpayers is that Gloria was talking about loans from the general fund to help support the, the urban renewal district in its, in its inability to meet its obligations. That will go away, and in fact, the urban, in fact, the general fund over time will be repaid. It's it's out it's out of pocket. Um, 
that means to you less less reliance on any support from other from the from the rate funds from the, the enterprise funds as well as in the general fund that we can do that we are able to do more with the money that we receive and not have to sink it you know and not have to 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 lend it out to for now what is a faltering agency of the cities so the goal we were hurt pretty badly with the recession the great recession of 2008 and all those years took a big dent out of the city's finances as shown in part up here and a lot of what we did to try to get you know a lot of what we have to do now is make those loans from the general fund to the urban road district in the initial projections we, we expected a far better performance from the district than we got nobody was able to predict the great recession arriving and certainly we didn't and so the shortfall occurred so, but we think right now we're on a path, a good path to recovery. We've learned a lot from the, from history. We think we are not going, you know, that we will that that the job that we're doing now is far and away supported by the the data, the facts, the analysis, the expertise, and we think we're doing the right thing to help the rate payers, the taxpayers. I live in the city, so I have to pay those same rates that you pay and everybody else in this room pays for their water and sewer, and it certainly doesn't feel good to me either. So whatever we can do to 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 uh, you know bring that those costs down and make it and make you know make it make our government operate better and more efficiently, I'm all for it from a personal level as well as a professional level. And that urban renewal project out here, I think, is going to be a big winner for for the city. Well, I hear what you're saying, and this has been an ongoing years and years and years of talk about making things better. So far, we haven't gotten there, but. Until I, I feel like it, as a resident and homeowner, until we can see our taxes stop increasing from all the costs that we have to keep covering because things haven't gone right, until we can see our water and sewer rates at least stabilize, if not decrease, um, because of all the things that get done that are not financially and economically smart for our community, those things, nothing else really matters to me buying property and then trying to develop it into something that we hope will pay off i'm i just i'm not biting off on that because i think we need to fix what we have we aren't fixing our streets we drive over railroad tracks every day and have to go to a complete stop to get over them without bottoming our cars and yet that's been years of waiting for them to be fixed and yet we take our money and we go and buy more property. It, it, as a personal individual, I've always felt you, you take care of what you have right now, you pay off what you have right now before you go out and expand yourself into other areas in hopes that down the road it's going to pay off and be a smart move. Kind of like this, I don't know what they call that mess building over there. And I know that was a private thing, but we still, it, it's affected everybody in this community day in, day out for years and nothing's been done to fix that either, aesthetically, financially, or in any other way. And I'm just, as a resident, a taxpayer, and a water and sewer payer, I'm tired of all of it. And I'm tired, sorry David, but I'm really tired of all the words. But the words don't fix it. Can we get back? Yeah, I know. That wasn't much purpose, was that? It's not fair to them, really. Well, yeah, I, have a, I have an easy question. Like what is the average yeah. bill payment? What's the average bill payment for a residence in Independence? Oh, let me let me get to that. I have a slide that shows that. Now. Okay. Okay, it's coming up. So, just to summarize and water, we had many of the same issues going on, which is for maintenance of the water system. Although the water system is in much better shape than the sewer system was, uh, the utility is taken out. It's debt through the GO bond. We have the uncertain obligation with my net that you're all very well aware of. And we're looking at one additional bond for around a million, million one to make needed repairs to the water system. Just to look at the history, uh, this is assuming 800 cubic feet per month. Uh, and that's probably a summer water usage for a single family house on a three quarter inch meter. So in 2010, that added up to about $42.27, and by 2015, it was $55.33, I believe, if I can read that correctly. 
Uh, and that was increasing at the rate of about 5.4% five five per year over that period. Going forward, we're looking at it, assuming my net stabilized so where we got it, going from $56 to $65 roughly per month. And that's for 800 cubic feet. Uh, clearly, the, those who use less water, those numbers would be smaller. Those using more water, those numbers would be larger. But they're going up uh, proportionally for everybody. Uh, commercial customers pay according to the meter size they have and by the amount of water that they use. Yes. Let's just use 55.33. So then, how much of that went to pay off the MyNet bond issue? <laughs> and that, that number always comes up. So I'm, just, I'm just trying to get something in my yeah. mind. Yeah. Is it 10 bucks? Is it, I mean, judging by this, I'd say it's about a buck and a half, but I don't think that's. Oh, it's point. more than that. Okay. So it's about 27% of your total bill is going to my net. Whoa. Well, my base is 90. Of the of water. Of water. Yeah, my right. base is 90. Pardon me? My yeah. base is water. Oh, oh, you're talking about for water and sewer. Okay. Yeah. My base is 90, so. For water and sewer. Right. Yeah, this is just water. And storm. Oh, okay. And storm. And storm. Okay. It's so, the most I've ever paid in my life. If you stack those two up <laughs> with water on the bottom, and did I get that right? And sewer on top. And please, I put these slides together up on myself, but I'm colorblind. So, <laughs> so the solid one down below is the sewer rate, and the tall one is the water rate. So in 2015, the sum of those two was $98. The sum of those two this year is $100.66 per month for somebody using 800 cubic feet. So that's probably a typical summertime water and sewer bill. In the winter, water consumption drops off substantially, so the water amount would drop accordingly. So, and each one of you uses water probably differently than others, depending on your habits, household size, and a multitude of other issues that, that go into it. But, yeah, so all together, you know, in the past few years, you've been seeing sewer and water increases go up a combined 7.6% roughly. Going forward, it's going to be about 3.4%. And again, there's a lot of uncertainty there about my net. Um, and uh, what happens with growth within the community. Growth in the community usually results in a lowering of rates because most of the costs associated with operating these two utilities are fixed. So as you add a new customer on, it usually goes to the bottom line. In other words, it doesn't increase cost as much as it does increase revenue. So is it, is it safe to say, I think that question he asked is a good question, that my net impacts our water right. bill somewhere between ten and fifteen dollars a month. Is that a reasonable? That sounds about right. right. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty substantial. Okay. Yeah, that's just, I want to get something in my mind. Yep, that's it. <laughs> but what percentage is that? It's about twenty-seven percent of your total bill. Of yeah. your water bill. Of your water bill. I'm sorry. Of just the water bill. I have a I have a comment on. If I may, I'm Harry Blado. I live in the airport. Uh, I go south in the winter. I'm one of the victims of you guys charging me when I'm not here, uh, as other people are charged also. Uh, but <clears throat> the question in my mind is why doesn't the city inform the residents exactly what our payments are going to, like the uh, electric company does? If it's 2%, 2 cents. For a franchise fee, the electric company identifies it to the payer. And uh, that type of identification of every single part of our bill paying should be presented to the payers. There is no reason in my mind why the city can't do that if other utility companies can do it. Now, uh, they, they all, I, I could show you, I'm going to go before the council and make this a formal request because it isn't formal here, but I'm gonna do it before the council. And I have before mentioned to you in the last meeting, I go down south in the winter, it's two of us, same type of house, same size and all that. And my water bill down south is 
and my sewer bill is $16. And it's amazing to me that a city that uh, like that in Arizona pumps their water out of a well just like you all do and they put in the lines, a private company put in the lines and the city put in the sewer lines when they made the developments and I can and the city can charge that kind of money and pay for the utilities. It's, it, it, it's a, I can't understand, it's a no-brainer. Okay. Well, but you. anyway, my bottom line is you all charge it, and, and I'm not going to be able to change that, but I demand from the citizens' point of view, the payers' point of view, to know every single penny of that money where it's going. And that includes the uh, money that goes to the general fund. We should know that. It's not fair for you guys to tell us that we're paying for water and sewer when it's not paying for water and sewer. We should know that. You talk about government in the sunshine, you guys are as bad as Washington. <laughs> well, it's not quite that bad. There is the annual budget and the annual audit, but it's not a bad suggestion. I'm also aware of what electric and other regulated utilities do in terms of informing your bill. I think it's a good idea. It's not a bad idea at all. Keep in mind those numbers are come out from when the utility files a rate case with the Public Utility Commission. And when they do that, the Public Utility Commission identifies each one of their costs and approves it, has to approve it to go forward, and they do that. And in that year, that number is very accurate. Okay. Between regulator, regulatory hearings, which could be four or five, six years, those numbers change quite, can change quite a bit and probably do, but they continue to report the numbers and the percents that were given to the utility when they filed their last rate case. I don't think that's such a bad idea. I mean, clearly it would help you if you knew what, at least what the MyNet debt portion of your water bill looked like. Uh, and if you're going to take that up with the city council, it's yeah, not I'm going to take that up with the city council. I definitely am. Yeah. Uh, keep, keep in mind that utilities like the electric utility or a private water company, which I work for with as well, <clears throat> have a single purpose, um, and that is to supply electricity or water. The city has multiple functions, and it has to balance its entire budget, not just sewer, not just water. And it can't and has to make decisions year by year about how it allocates its cost out to all of its revenue sources. So the difference between cities and their budgeting and a single purpose utility are pretty different. Um, and they also have different regulatory authorities that they have to respond to. But I, I, understand I, I agree that they can be different, but that doesn't mean that they can inform the payer exactly what the money is going for. That's correct. Every single penny should be accounted for. Well, just, I mean, just understand that that will vary. I don't care if it varies, I want to know. Okay. Tell yeah, me. We brought this up at the last meeting, and you indicated that we were maybe going to be able to look at having that happen. Is that anytime soon where our bill will actually define each expense? Well, we've, we started to have that conversation, and I have to say we have not completed that conversation. We did start right after that meeting and haven't taken it a lot further, but I, I still hear the need and the desire. Um, and we will, and, uh, and yes, we will keep working on it because I, I, I agree with the need for transparency. That said, and there, all of our information, our financial information, and how all of every of all the money is being spent collectively, not individually by customer, but collectively is on our, our website in the budget in document in the audit documents. It spells out line by line how we spend our money. So it's the collected amount that we have to we use to generate rates so like that you know we to, to break it out like customers a little more of a challenge but it's not one that we're not not insurmountable and we're we, we will undertake that you know further take that conversation try to get to try to get to a resolution for everybody do we have any time frame of actually instead of just being on a conversation basis can we have a time frame where we can actually see a bill come out because we know it's critical people want it that a bill might come out you know three months six months eight months a year where it will define all of the costs that we're paying for in the water sewer bills i think um our main challenge on doing that 
is with our software. And so we are working with our we are working with our software uh, company in being able to break out uh, those kinds of items. It's it's more of a more of a challenge on that side of it. Um, so as far as a timeline, no, we don't have really a timeline. Uh, it's going to be uh, more with with our software uh, developer as far as what they can come up with in order for us to be able to do that. Other companies have software that defines that, like PG, G, or whatever. Right. And How come we can't? I think, I think that it goes back to what Ray was saying in that um, it's different in a municipal software program than it is in a single purpose um, utility. So, for instance, with your uh, electric utility, or if it's a, just a single service uh, water utility, uh, their software is developed differently to be able to respond that way, to break out those kind of costs. But because we have um, a number of funds, and our funds are broken out as kind of business type and governmental type, uh, it adds that challenge of being able to combine things like that in a in a utility bill. But it's like David said, it's not insurmountable. But it's going to take us a little time, and particularly with the software. I guess I'm having a hard time understanding that part too because the municipality isn't a new concept. I mean, it's been a no, it's forever. not. And a lot of them have water sewer combat combine combine sorry combination of building. So I don't understand why there isn't something like that out there that you can just be acquired, implemented, and, and right. Um, that, that just doesn't make there, sense. I know it's that it's that complicated. I, I don't know. So um, there is there there is uh, separate software programs that we have looked at um, that can break out kind of that information. It wouldn't necessarily be on the bill, but it would be more um, for the transparency project and as far as being able to, you know, even at, in our newsletter on a monthly basis, be able to give you a, uh, a graph of how your utility bill is broken out. And that's more, that is like a single purpose type software that we can um, download our data into. Uh, we've kind of weighed those costs. Um, they're, they're not inexpensive. Um, but it's another, again, another option that we have looked at and we are exploring. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in, in lieu of getting one of those kinds of software programs, uh, I would like to attempt to do, uh, I do a quarterly financial report to our council and I would like to attempt to maybe answer those questions at least on a quarterly basis and do that work that kind of data so that you can see what's going in from your water and sewer rates into uh, like MyNet and into the administrative transfers to the general fund. I think that is something that I can do and uh, hopefully in the next uh, hopefully maybe for the next quarterly financial report, I would be able to break, you know, start breaking that kind of information out. That's a step in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I would be happy to start that, that, trying to do that. And yeah, I think it's very useful information. And it, it's useful for, for the management too. Well, I mean, this isn't a fair statement, but this building wasn't inexpensive, but it got built anyway. So ask for something like this seems a little bit small compared right. to well, what we want to see yeah. because of what we're paying all the time out of our pocket. And, and right. just real quickly, is there any chance of getting a copy of this in a size that's readable? Because what we have here, you can't even tell in yeah, the that, cities. Yeah, that's a good point. I'll, 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 I can send a copy. Well, I I really like yeah. copy. Actually, we've got we've got bigger ones, and we can post those on our on our website. Would that be helpful? Okay. I mean, do I know when I can find it there? Tomorrow? Okay. And it will stay there for how long? So I'm not going to be here long for 
it'll be on the website, not on the Facebook page. It'll be on the website. Right. And so, so on on the website under the finance. So if you go up into the city services, and drop down and go into finance, it'll be there in the documents for finance. So let me add, oh, there's a simple solution to the problem with my net. Your rates are based on your cost of doing business. So let them raise their rates to make all the necessary payments. Then the city wouldn't be on the hook to pay. And, uh, oh yeah, you want me to address that one? Oh yeah, that's right. That's on page 22. <laughs> Yeah, it's not a bad idea. What they're trying to do right now is be a, is, is present competitive competitive rates. Um, so you're probably they could do that. Their subscription rate would go down. Their costs would go up. It could be a you know a circle that ends up with them going bankrupt or or having worse. But I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I, honestly, I don't. Um, I I never. <laughs> thought about running a business like that. That sounds more like the way you'd run a city than it does <laughs> how you run a business. <laughs> it's like an electric utility, each class of customers pays their own cost to provide service. It's not subsidized by other <coughs> classes of service. Right. Yeah, you're right. Well, I can, I can address that a little bit since I've worked in that area as well. So electric utilities are monopolies, just like the sewer and water utilities are here. My net is not a monopoly. It has to compete against two or three other suppliers. And if you ever watch the TV ads on internet service, like you can get 40 megabytes for 40 bucks, and you see those advertisements. But when you clear away the smoke and you light up your computer and you say, how many megabytes am I getting at this instant from that server, and it comes up 14, not 40, you start scratching your head. It's a fairly complex issue, and I hate to say it, but Madison Avenue has had a big impact on getting accurate information out to potential customers about what you're really getting in internet service. But they are quite different, and their cost structures are substantially different, and so is their demand for their services. It's, it's, uh, it's not a simple answer. Yeah, let me add to that as well. The MyNet sets its rates, and I've been there for rate setting a number of times. They set it on a competitive basis. They look with it. They look what the rest of the market is charging for similar similar offerings. They'll look at what Charter's offering. They'll look at what uh, Dish and DirecTV are offering. They'll look at the price of those offerings. And it, it's pretty clear. It's not a, it is, as, as Ray has said, it's not a monopoly. They're in a competitive environment. So it's like any other business. If they charge more for the same, they're going to lose their market share, and getting market share back is much harder than than you know than retaining what you have. So it, it would just take it down the path that, that Ken was suggesting, that ultimately to bankruptcy if you if you're not going to be competitive, which means we'd be on the hook for the entire bill, not just a portion of the bill. I disagree with what you're saying. One one thing maybe people don't know in this room, but just just to let you know. Maya has three basic services. They have the internet, and they have a hard line telephone, and they have the TV cable type thing. The only one that is truly profitable is the internet. So they're really providing the TV and providing the telephone at, to, cover their, to cover some of their fixed costs. They have high margins. I mean, high, they have a high uh, percentage of the market, but they're not really turning good margins on those because they're so competitive. And, and if you look at it, the other reason is because people are do, they're getting away from cable TV, people are getting away from hard lines, and they're going to the data. So really, and we're in a great position because we have the fiber optics to provide the data. But anyway, that's kind of one of the things most people don't know. I didn't know it until I got on, the, uh, on that committee. Well, it's like, a, it's like that is a circular going down type thing. But not the whole business, just those two parts of the three. Quick question about this table before it disappears. Just can, can anyone explain why? I can understand Monmouth is less because they're not covering <coughs> the minor uh, costs into that. But even without, even with that, there's still less um, the rates are less in Monmouth. So I was curious why that was. Was that because they have a, a larger user base? 
or let me let me go through this with you okay. just so that you've got it and make a few comments here. So the purple line, or at least the dark one, is independence. Okay, and the clear line is the median of all of those. And before you think you're right in the middle and your average and everything, let me tell you that this is not a a scientifically drawn random sample. Okay, so I picked up a bunch of communities that have lower rates than you do, and a bunch of communities that have a higher rates than you do, just so you can see what the range looks like. And you can see the community names down there. I think the one at the far end down there is Toledo, Oregon. And the next one, I think, is Lebanon, Oregon. At the far end, at this end, you've got the Tualatin Valley Water District and the Talent uh, Water District down in the Ashland area. So this is the combined sewer and water rates, okay? And I put independence right in the middle. So if you look at only the household water bills, you'll know that yours is quite a bit above the median of all those communities. And that is primarily due to my net, but it also has a lot to do with physical features and how things are operated. When you look at the sewer side, your sewer rates are less than the median of those same communities. And that's because you're operating a lagoon system, not a mechanical system, and things have been well, well operated, and you've taken advantage of a 40-year-old asset pretty well. So why do these rates differ so much? You know, so in my line of business, everybody asks me what the average is, right? Do you all know what central tendency means in calculating an average? It means that when you put them all together, you get this little bell-shaped curve, and if they're really close together, that means you've got a great average. The average for water rates, when you consider all the factors, is very broad, and it's because of basic differences. So why are the differences there? One is water supply and quality. You have a fairly decent water quality and supply here. You don't have heavy mineral content. You don't have nasty stuff in your water like some of our clients have. I mean, I've seen all kinds of water treatment plants in my career. Um, they have different sources that might be further away. We've got some communities where the water source is very distant and you've got a very long pipeline to service it. Uh, distance to customers. I've got some clients where the customers are very spread out. The density, the household density is very low maybe three houses per acre. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you're running water line way, way out there and you're putting in a lot of water pipe to serve a few customers. And then level of treatment. That's another big thing both in water and in sewer. Um, if you live on the coast, you have to do a lot less treatment of sewage before you dump it into the ocean because the ocean is so big. The EPA and DEQ allows you to foul it up a lot more than if you're dumping into a freshwater stream. And if you're getting water out of the ground to use, like my daughter has in Austin, Texas, I got chewed out really badly for trying to get some cold water out of the tap. I turned on the tap and I rinsed out my glass a couple of times and my son-in-law and daughter were all over me because guess what? The water is cheap from the utility, but they've got this huge water treatment plant inside their house because the water stinks that comes to them from the city. It's not bad to drink, you can drink it all you want, but their water rates, when you add in the cost of treating in the house, it's gotta be at least three or four times more than what I pay in Vancouver, Washington for water. Uh, terrain affects pumping, especially in sewage, but also in water. Uh, you've got cities like Lincoln City, where every drop of sewage is pumped at least 14 times. You know how many pump stations that is? <laughs> there are cities built on a bunch of hills, and they got to pump the sewage up and down and up and down to get it to the treatment plant. And there's a long history in many communities of different piping that's been put in. So I've got some communities that have pipes running under houses and under buildings. These are main sewer lines or water lines, like 10 and 12 inch water lines. And uh, to service those is very expensive. You're under private property. Uh, you've got problems. You've also got problems with the type of pipe that's been put in. Um, you've noticed all the, all the uh, uh, discussion of lead in pipe in Flint, Michigan, and in Portland, Oregon schools. Uh, you've got different qualities of pipes that have been installed over the years that require different kinds of treatment and repair. 
Uh, demand varies substantially from climate to climate. Uh, the uh, Arizona, you have a property there? Yes. Okay, and do you water the lawn outside? No, sir, my lawn is rock. That's right. I so, don't water anything. So I don't water anything here either, by the way. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but many of your neighbors do. So the water demand is quite different from area to area, which has quite an impact on how big your water source has to be, how much storage you need, what pipe sizes you need, how much pumping you have to do. There's a big impact on the cost of supplying it. And the same thing for sewage. And economic composition, commercial and industrial mix, has a big influence on how much water is used. I've got some clients where 25% of the water that they produce is sold to one company. We charge them 10% of the cost of operating the system. Because if we charge them anything more, we'd have trouble selling bonds because the bond buyer would look at it as an incredibly risky venture because the decision by one customer could cut their water revenue by 25%, but 10% they'll accept. Okay? So when you look at these rates, you gotta look at all this stuff that goes on. And then there's policy issues like cross-subsidization among classes. If you go over the coast, you'll find out that the failing fishing industry and fish packing houses all get subsidized water rates and subsidized sewer rates because the community doesn't want to see those industries go away. So the sewer and water bills for residences are much higher because they're subsidizing the company that packs fish. Uh, you got water conservation directives. If you get down to southern Oregon, like Ashland, where they nearly ran out of water for the past three years each summer, uh, they have conservation measures in, in place, but that means the rates have to be higher because they're selling less water, right? So you get, you get those issues there. Also in Ashland, um, they decided to subsidize their sewer rates. So they adopted a food and beverage tax, which goes to pay debt service on their bonds. Okay? So consequently, their sewer rates aren't as high as they would otherwise be. And then there's financing issues, cash versus borrowing. There's a water company in Southern Oregon that happens to be now selling water to the city of Ashland that has never borrowed money. It charges today's water users for tomorrow's capital. And by doing that, they've never paid any interest. Their water rates are pretty low, but when they need capital improvements, they get huge rate increases because they need the money right away to pay for the capital improvement. And then there's general obligation or geo bonds versus revenue bonds. So city of independence in the past has relied heavily on revenue bonds. That means that it's revenue from user fees that are pledged to pay the debt service. Many communities, especially on the coast, go to general obligation bonds. They issue general obligation bonds that allows them to impose a property tax to pay the debt service. So it doesn't go on the water bill, it goes on property taxes. So if you go down the coast and you'll find out that there's just a whole bunch of geo bonds out there for water and sewer. Why is that? Because the residents who vote live there year round and work in pretty modest jobs with pretty modest value housing and they're surrounded by second homeowners whose houses range in price from a half million to over a million dollars. The voters figured out they can transfer the cost of building those utilities onto the people who don't live there by charging according to the value of the property, right? So you have to look at all of those issues, including budgeting. All of the cities, not just independents, in rough times has to look at every revenue source they've got to figure out how to balance their total budget. It isn't enough for a city to balance a sewer budget or a water budget or just those two budgets. It's got all those other budgets it has to deal with. And consequently, it's got interfund transfers that have to go on. Otherwise, during economic recessions, it has to cut police, major services. The city, by the way, went through that when that happened here, and many other cities have as well. If you pay attention to some of the stuff going on in Southern Oregon, where they also cut property taxes to zero, uh, when the economic downturns came, they were running out of, they just don't have police forces you know, in, some, in some counties and communities down there. So all of those things impact what the final sewer and water rate is. So when you start comparing it from community to community, you have to know what all of their revenues are that are going in to support that utility and what all their costs are that may or may not be associated with the utility. In your case, it's my net for water. 
in other communities, it's, uh, well, uh, City Hall, that's a pretty common one if you look around. Um, or they've got other ventures that they've, they've undertaken and run into problems and have embedded some of that in their sewer and water rates. So to do that comparison uh, takes a lot more effort than just looking up who's paying what for uh, how much water. Uh, it's much more complex than first meets the eye. Any questions about that? I think for me, you just made the case in point for sending out a cover letter or a newsletter that explains it because if the citizens don't know that 27% of their bill is going to subsidize MyNet, then there can't be any other conversations with MyNet or, or with anything. And it's just, it, yeah, you need to inform people. And I, I think you just made the perfect point that that has to happen sooner than later because if people are um, trying to figure out how to lower their water bill and they're doing everything in their own power and yet it doesn't lower, people don't understand and they get frustrated with that. And so it, there's no reason not to inform the public and I think that would open up other conversations that need to happen in terms of maybe other services offered in town such as the the mine net and just so people know that that's what they are because it is a good service to have that in a in a town to have something like mine net fiber but people need to know that they are um helping that happen but through their water bill so there's a, a disconnect because of lack of knowledge and lack of information coming from the city and it seems like if if the um, software is hard to do do the quick thing do do a cover letter do a newsletter that goes out with the bill that updates people on a regular basis uh, yeah. thank you for that I, you know, that message is coming from, through loud and clear this evening we, we will be working on that I, I have a question for the economist here and that is I, I understand you're telling me that if, if we have more people living here and more businesses coming in that that will help with our rates, which makes sense. But at what point do we have to really start getting worried that if our if our high rates are going to be, you know, kind of a stopping that, not a letting, not attracting people coming in? And so that's a concern for mine. I want to see the growth happening here in, in this in this town, but I, I don't want to be scaring people away or businesses away and developers away. Well, the other area. And, and did a fair amount of work in was economic development. How do cities grow and where do they grow and what do you do to attract business to it? And when I first started my career 40 some years ago, um, the old word was just the three T's of economic development. Tap, toilet, tar. That's all you need. If you could provide that efficiently, then you could attract businesses that could take advantage of resources in the area. Uh, if you do it efficiently, households accept it. And at the time, there wasn't a, a, a huge impact by these utility bills on corporations or even small companies making business decisions because the public utilities that were being provided were such a small fraction of their total cost each year. And that's still pretty much the case today. So today, there are four T's to economic development. You got the tap, toilet, tar, and now it's telecommunications. So when I go into a community, especially a rural community, one of the first things I do is light up my laptop to find out what kind of internet service is there. If the internet service is non-existent or is really poor. I know the education system is substandard because the teachers can't get current information. I know that whatever medical services are there, whether it's just a doctor's office, a clinic, or a hospital, can't telecommunicate to find out how to treat a particular patient with a strange situation or a severe injury. And I know that the market that operates there, and it's awfully, often a rural market, isn't getting the farm reports on commodity prices very efficiently because they're not on the internet, right? So when the two city councils made the decision, I'm not sure they made the perfect decision to get internet into the two communities, it was probably a pretty bright move. Whether or not they overinvested is a, you know, that's open to debate. But 
they could be. So that's how it occurs. Even in today's market with the rates that you saw up there, like the city of Ashland, which has very high rates, or the city of Toledo, which has quite high rates, uh, it's, those aren't the things that make or break the economy. Those aren't the things that are attracting or, or that aren't the things that are detracting uh, uh, that kind of development from occurring. Not having those services in place, those four services in place, that is a detractor. So your city's done a good job, I think, of providing the services it does efficiently in the face of the economic constraints it faces. And it's been through some pretty tough times. I think the first time I talked to David here, when he first became city manager and I first read one of your audits, I thought, oh my God, this is gonna take years to bail this thing out. And it has. It's been, what, five years since we started down that road? Six years. Refinanced a lot of debt. Uh, delayed a whole bunch of capital improvements, laid off a whole bunch of people, and now the economy is coming back, so you're rebuilding. It, it takes time. I mean, you, you're in a pretty deep hole there. You built this building on the expectation the property values are going to stay high, and they dropped. They dropped like a rock. You probably saw that in your own uh, uh, assessed value of your property going down into the real market value anyway. And so the city made a bunch of decisions almost at the same time. Build a city hall, do my net, and then the market fell out from underneath it. Bad situation. So you're still bailing out from that, and it's gonna take a while longer before you actually see the total turnaround, I think. But at least your audits are being done on time. <laughs> the budget's balanced. I don't know if you read an audit from four or five years ago, but uh, the audit report that came with it was very thick with comments about how ill-managed the city had been up to that point. And the comment pages now are down to one page, zero page. So the city's come quite a ways in straightening out its finances and getting on top of capital improvements that have been put off now for several years. So I'm not sure what more I can tell you before I go back to retirement. <laughs> one other question. Sure. This 27% from my net bothers me. Mm -hmm. I don't have that, whatever that number was, $55. Mm -hmm. I'm way past that one. Don't ask me why. I don't know why, but I'm way past that. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking at $300 water bills. And so, uh, is that linear? Uh, you know, I take away, see, it should be, a, is it a linear function? It can't be a linear function. It, it, in terms well, of I mean, if I, if I do 800 Oh, 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 yes. Yeah, and I do 1,600 units. Yeah. It's not 27% of 16. No, it's 27% of the average. Okay. So the, the 10 or $15 per water bill. Yeah. So if you have a $300 bill, it's still only 10 or $15 per year water bill. Yeah, yeah. that's what I was looking for. Okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. That's not right here. Thanks. Yes. Do we, um, do we subsidize any industry or businesses in town in terms of promising lower uh, rates on any any utilities i just out of curiosity there, there's no there's no existing subsidies to any to any business in the community whatsoever the, to the extent that we consider subsidies is strictly in the urban renewal district and that won't be in terms of water rates sewer rates anything of the nature be, it could be in the course in the in the in development costs costs that we fully expect to recover through new property taxes from the uh, the new businesses so there won't be any no subsidies that you or me in my house would have to pay on behalf of those businesses for any business. And I also have in terms of um, my net, every time like when the Riverview apartments went in, my net laid all the fibers to go out to service those apartment buildings, which hopefully brought a lot more customers. It did. But also then when you have new complex, like if there's an apartment building going here, that will be yet another expense to lay lines that way. So there is, you know, hopefully it's offset, but yeah. in terms of the debt. Yeah, yeah. and that's how mine would view that. I mean, they would, they would invest in, you know, and we haven't yet to have that conversation about this particular development, but likely it will be served by mine and very likely the cost will be, you know, the cost of installation costs and the, you know, the upfront capitalization of that project will be quickly recovered and they will be making money off that development. Their business model is based on their getting new customers. So there's, a, there's always an incremental cost with a new customer, but there's also incremental revenue that should more than offset that cost. Otherwise your cost structure's off. 
And I think their cost structure is fine for that purpose. I guess another question, the, the capital improvements on increasing the, uh, the lagoon surface area, right, that we need to do, um, is that, that's predicated on, on, on being able to sell those bonds, correct? That you're talking about the? Yes. And um, is, is there an issue that people are gonna be less willing to be looking at buying uh, those bonds and, and taking, um, taking the debt if, if we're, if it looks like what you're showing on that graph, there, it doesn't look really good right now in terms of our debt in our income versus the debt. Right. Um, well, let's see. Six years ago, you weren't credit worthy. Nobody would lend right. you money. And today, you're very credit worthy. Uh, and so, when the investors look at how the city is financed now, how it's funding its stealth, it looks very promising. You have an A rating? It's an A minus A stable. Minus. Okay. Which is not bad for a community this size. The best you could hope for in a community this size is probably an A rating. And those ratings go clear down to C and D, by the way, so <laughs> just so you know the scale. Yeah, you were off the scale six years ago. Would it, would it be safe to say, just throwing this one out, that should Minet become, if Minet became, uh, let's say, Level. They didn't. So they, they paid the whole nine yards. Is it safe to say that the city would commit that if that was to happen, they would reduce the water bills by the amount that they had been paying up front? Luckily, I'm just a consultant. This <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it seems like a logical question. Well, you know, we'd certainly make that analysis, and and uh, it's a good point, and, and it's a likely result. Yeah. Uh, Twenty-seven percent is not insignificant. So. So yeah, um, based on our capital needs, you know, depending on when they become solvent, um, they do have uh, quite a bit of back debt that they still need to pay to us and to the city of Monmouth. But if they meet their annual debt. But if they meet their annual debts, um, certainly it is conceivable. It's a conversation we would definitely have with the yeah, council. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Definitely a conversation. Sure, but that council. is the goal. Yeah. Of it, it, we don't look at found money and say, "Oh, good, we're going to we're going to go spend it." <laughs> so I mean, that's not our approach. So we try to be very conservative with those those resources. Yes. How does the projected four point four percent increase in like the water rates and things like that? How does that compare to um, elsewhere, other communities and stuff? In terms of just the uh, the rate increases. So. Oh, well, that's a loaded question. Um, I you, well, I can tell you, Monmouth is about to increase our water rates by 9%. Yeah. So that gives you some, I, I doubt that there's an average anywhere to be seen. But. No, and, and so often it depends on what you're going to do. I got one client that has lead and joints in their water distribution system. It's a $10 million problem. Right now, all they're doing is dumping a chemical in the water to balance the pH so it doesn't erode the lead to levels that would cause it to trigger it. But they're right on the cusp of needing to replace all that stuff. So if they went ahead with that project, you know, you're looking at a double digit rate increase off the bat just to cover the debt service on. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these systems, I didn't show you the other finances, but we look at balance sheets quite a bit. All Oregon municipalities have to maintain a balance sheet that shows how much of their fixed assets are depreciated. Okay. So when you start looking at accumulated depreciations of over 50% of their invested capital, I can go to them and say, when do you want to start working on the rate increase? Because you're gonna to have to replace about 50% of your capital here pretty quickly. And it's a, not a bad measure. I don't didn't use it for marketing, of course, but um, yeah, you look at communities that have neglected repairs in their system over a very long period of time, and they have pretty serious problems, like low water pressure, people call them up, you get large complaints about, uh, gee, you know, I went to take a shower this morning and the water just trickled out. Why is that? Well, we got water problems. So, yeah, you. I wish I had a forecast of what the average is for everybody, but I don't think that exists anywhere. Thanks for up here. 
I think you're fair to wrap up. With. All right, thank you. Um, I, I just want to point out one other thing, by the way, this presentation I gave about three times to city council in public meetings <laughs> last year. And how many work sessions did we have with council before we finally came to the final decisions? It was a couple of work sessions as well, which, you know, they're, they're all published. Um, you might keep note of that. I mean, all the public, all the uh, city council meetings are advertised and open to the public. And that's where a lot of the information comes out because they, and their Oregon public meeting law, which is a pretty strong law, the decisions and the conversations have to be held in public at advertised meetings. And that's where you expect to get a lot of citizen input. Like they open it up for discussion from the public at every one of the meetings that was at. So just on behalf of the staff and Ray and uh, I think my city councilor in the back, thank you for coming here, spending the evening with us. I know this is probably not the best, most fun way to spend an evening for anybody, but I know obviously it's a point of interest. We will have this online, uh, this video. We will continue to take questions and respond to everything afterwards. So thank you again.